So we're gonna look at Google Cloud Storage. And to me, like this is pretty amazing. You guys have some really good stuff. You've got cookies and storing UEIDs. You have memcache, and uh, which is uh, volatile but strongly consistent. You have the data store, which is not volatile, it's permanent, but it is uh, eventually consistent, right? Meaning it might be a couple of seconds if you put, some, put something there before you could pull it out. And so in combination, we can work with all those and cover each other's weaknesses. I like the way that was said uh, last week. And, uh, and then today, we're going to look at Google Cloud Storage, which is where we store files. And then all of this is going to automatically scale. So as you build an application, if it becomes popular, uh, you won't have to worry about how do you grow this thing. And uh, so that, that's pretty cool. So I really think that, you know, like that song when I was doing this, working on this stuff, last couple of days, I got the power, it was like coming back to me. Because it's like to actually like upload a file and store it, that's a pretty huge thing. Like if you were doing this a decade ago, you're building YouTube, you know, and then selling it in eight months for $2 billion. And it's like to be able to upload files, store them, access it, be able to do that quickly, it's a very powerful thing. I just talked to a business today. I was like, okay, I want to send in my paperwork. They're like, uh, can I just email it to you? She's like, or upload it somewhere. She's like, no, you got to mail it. We're hoping to get to that point soon sometime this year where you could upload files. I was thinking, okay, well, I know what the person who's going to build that should be doing. <laughs> or one, one good way to do it. That's what we're going to look at today. Uh, just a little FYI, there's a cool little concurrency example, the Golang training repo, which I have. A student asked a question, and, uh, and the student posted some code. And so this is just a really nice example of concurrency and channels, if you're interested in how concurrency works in Go, how to run things in parallel. Uh, so concurrency is uh, not necessarily parallelism. Concurrency is like doing two things uh, simultaneously, doing two things your processor has two tasks running. It's like multitasking. Okay, Parallelism is doing them at the same time. So I could have two tasks running concurrently, task A and task B. All right, let me work on A for a little bit. Let me work for, on B for a little bit. Let me work on A for a little bit. That's what the CPU would be doing, the concurrency. And parallelism would be we're going to be working on A and B at the same time in two different CPUs, right? Or if a CPU can handle doing two things at the same time, the same CPU. So uh, it's just kind of a nice example of how channels work. So channels are a way that you could communicate in, in Go. There's buffered and unbuffered channels. These are unbuffered. And so when you put something on a channel, it blocks the code, right, until you're ready to take it off the channel. Um, I don't know. Anybody interested in seeing a minute or two of this, or you just want to get on over to the other stuff, just the concurrency stuff? I find it pretty interesting. Hey, I'm already there. I think. Yeah, so go run main. So uh, that's the result. And we'll take a look at what that means here in a second. Kind of interesting the way it works. And so here we're launching a Go routine, which is a Go, you know, we have normal document program flow where we enter main. This is where code execution begins. And then we just sort of go through control flow, sequence, iteration loops, or conditionals, right? And that's how we kind of control the flow of our code. Those are like the three con control flow structures. Well, here, this is like, so we enter main, and we declare a variable n is equal to 10. So initialize, and it's going to be an int. And then we make a channel, int. So channel is like a pipeline through which we can communicate. Different processes could send things on a pipeline from one process to another, and they're synchronized, right? So we could synchronize our different things that are running to make sure that certain things happen at certain times. So we make a channel for that takes ints, and we make one that takes bools, and then we come to this, and uh, and this launches a go routine, and so this go routine launches, and then program flow just continues right down to here, and this is off and running on its own in another process, another Go routine. Go routines are really light. Jump in. Um, yeah, that Go, Go statement is for calling a function in another uh, threat in another Go routine. Um, and then it's also doing an anonymous function right here. 
So the the uh, from the funk to the closing curly brace is an anonymous, not not the not the parentheses at the end, just the closing curly brace. It is a uh, that's an anonymous function declaration, and then you're calling and then you're calling it in another Go routine with the Go and the curl and the parentheses. You mean like a, in the for loop right below it? So no, right here. It's he's creating an anonymous function and he's calling it another Go routine all in one step right Normally there. Normally we create a function, it's func, and then some identifier, you know, my function thing. And then arguments, parameters would go there, and then returns would go here, and then our code would go here. And if it had a receiver, right, it'd be here. All right, so that's a normal signature of a function. And, uh, and so an anonymous function is, well, you know, no receiver, no name. It's just like func, and then any parameters or arguments and any returns. So that's an anonymous function. And then if we want to immediately execute that function, just like we'd call a function, we do put the, you know, like if we had this right here, right, and let's just say my function thing, and then if I wanted to call my, my function thing, my function thing, right, that would call it and run it. And if this was taking, had parameters defined like age, int, I'd then pass in, you know, dear lord, <laughs> how'd I get so old? You know, I then pass it in. That's going to execute that function. But that notation right here is where we execute a function. Just the because that's you know at the end of the function we specify what arguments that function is going to take, and that's determined by which parameters the function is defined with. So this was defined with no parameters, right? So when we call it, we don't pass any in. So this is an anonymous function self-executing being launched in its own Go routine. Interesting. And what it does is that's just going to go off and that's going to loop a thousand times. And it's going to take whatever value of the iteration we're on and send that onto channel C, which is, uh, receives an int. right? And then when this is all done looping, we're going to close that channel. And then down here, we're going to loop n times, 10 times. Okay, So n is 10. We're going to loop 10 times. And each time through the loop, we're going to call a function. Right, so here's another anonymous function. It's defined with a parameter i, takes an int. Okay, I could have also called this x. This could be slightly confusing. Well, now I'm going to select that i. Right, I could have called that x and x because this i right there would be a different scope from that one. You would have variable shadowing, right? So it would no longer be this one here. When it was i, it's this one. But that's maybe a little bit more clear. Okay. And, uh, and what it's doing is we're going through this loop 10 times. Each time through the loop, we're going to pass in as an argument when we execute this anonymous function. When we execute it, it takes one argument. We're passing in i, right? And, uh, and then that function is launched in a Go routine, and it's off and running. So we're launching 10 Go routines. So there's 11 processes. 11 Go routines we've launched here. This one right here, which is putting an int onto a channel. And then this one right here, right, which is going to do something. And each time we're launching 10 of those, and each time it's taking in whatever iteration loop with it. And the reason we're, we're passing that in is because if, in the question a student posed to me online, their code was like this. And they're like, why is it that my code is always printing out 10? Right for every Go routine. So if I ran this code now, all it's going to say is 10. All right? They're like, why is it 10? Well, because you launched 10 of these, and it's referencing i, and the scope of i is this for loop. So those Go routines are off running on their own, but it's looking back in, in this larger program to the variable i. Right? And so all 10 of those got launched. And they're saying, what's the value of i? Well, those went 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Right? And then it hit. 10, it incremented and says 10 less than 10, because n is 10 here. Is 10 less than 10? No, we're out of here. But the variable i is 10 now, and so now they are all 10, <laughs> right? But by doing it like this, where you just have x and you pass that in, well, now it's, so to speak, taking the value with it. So each one will have its own unique value. So when you run it, 
right? They these this is the sort of the four two five zero eight six eight. That's the number that's being printed there. And what are we printing? We're printing. We're printing. Uh, we're ranging over C. So when you range over a channel, so the channels where we're putting stuff onto the channel. When we range over the channel, it pulls something off. So if something's on the channel, it pulls it off. And you can only put something on the channel when something is ready to take it off. It's like a handshake. That's the synchronization of an unbuffered channel. I'm putting some. One routine's putting something on a channel. That code in that routine is stopping and waiting until another routine is going to take it off the channel. They have to pass that like a baton, like two runners passing a baton. So this is off and running and looping, and there's 10 of these processes pulling off of C. And this is off and running and putting onto C, and it tries to put onto C. I can't, I can't put, I can't, I'm, I'm stopped right here. My code is blocked right here until somebody takes it off of C. Okay, cool, I'll put another value on, right? And so those two processes are running in parallel. And um, so it pulls a value off, assigns that value to Q, and says, okay, this routine, whatever that routine was of this Go routine we launched, pulled off this value. And you can see that, okay, routine one pulled off 975, routine six pulled off 976, right? Routine, where's 977? Routine two pulled off 977. You'll be like, wait, those aren't sequential. No, they're not because you know it's it's uh, who knows who got to that, for, that thank print you. line first. Yeah, who knows who got to that print line first, right? Isn't that crazy? So you you know uh, it's just a whole different kind of programming. And so then what the, what happens is ten times we're going to put true onto done, and done is this channel right here. And so when each of these guys, the range will exit when there's when the channel C has been closed. So that's been closed, right? Well, after we put a thousand values on, it closes C, and then these guys are like, hey, can I still get some off C? Whoa, nothing's left on C, C's been closed, we're out of here. We're done. So they put true to done, and we need that to happen 10 times, because 10 of these got launched. So down here, we loop 10 times, and we take off of done, whatever value is put on, and just throw it into the ether. We could, if we wanted, assign it to a variable. Right. Strangely enough, I almost think you'd see that. Like, let me assign it to nothing. But when pulling it off a channel, you could just do that. And I'm sure there's some reason I don't recollect what it is. So this code right here is blocking. We start here in main. We go da 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 da. Wham! Launch a go routine ten times. Wham! Launch go routines. Come down here and start. I is equal to zero. Done. Whoa. There's no no value on that channel. My code right there is blocked. Right, and so that code, my main waits until I've got that's a semaphore flag. My main waits until I've pulled off all the values, signaling to me the synchronization process that all of my other routines running in parallel are now on pause. And I think I've showed you a little bit of the stuff you can watch at lynda.com where we do like image processing you know, and launching a whole load of crap and doing like 98 billion operations in 15 minutes, right, in Go routine. So that's really kind of an interesting application of brute force image analysis. <laughs> so, so the reason why we want to pause right here, though, is uh, in a lot of programming languages, Java included, if the main thread goes away, you're still good as long as you have other threads running. In Go, when the main Go routine exits, the entire program stops. So we have to make sure to keep the main the main function still running yeah, until thank you. all the other threat Go routines yeah, are done. Because they're all part of this program, which is encamp so, encapsulated with which the main. This is different from other programming languages, but this this is the way you would do it. And in fact, this is such a popular pattern that there's actually a uh, built-in uh, standard library item called the wait group, which basically does this with the duns. Cool, huh? How many people uh, got some of their money's worth on that one? So you can check out these questions from students. This is all my Udemy training, and then also a whole lot of other information about Go routines right there, where it goes through uh, other normal things that you use when doing concurrency and parallelism, like weight groups or mutexes um, or the atomicity and race conditions. Questions? Yeah, questions? 
may interest you to know that when you